Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event at New York School of Law. Um, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. For those of you that don't know the Brennan Center, we have an interdisciplinary approach to trying to resolve problems of our day. Um, our Employees will spend part of their time in courthouses all across the country trying to uh, bring about and stop uh, problems that are ha happening in all sorts of areas ranging from uh, the Muslim ban to voting suppression. Uh, we have staff members that spend their time in legislative houses because we're trying to pass laws or trying to stop bad laws from being passed that will make our democracy more robust and participatory. Um, we spend a lot of our time doing research. We are a think tank where we're actually trying to get deep into the bones of the systems of our democracy and try and identify what are the kinds of ways in which we can improve our systems. And we also do a lot of public education, events like this, where we're trying to bring people into the conversation so that they understand the pressing issues of today and know how they can best engage. Um, I'm Mirna Perez. I am a deputy director in the Democracy Program, and I'm director of the Voting Rights and Elections Project. And as a civil rights lawyer, I have been increasingly concerned about the alarming assault that we see on our democracy and the forces that threaten it, and those forces are both domestic and foreign. But one of the things that, uh, that civil rights lawyers and playwrights and journalists have in common is that we are often able to see the gaps that some Americans experience between what our country aspires to be and the way it actually is. And no person I can think of is better fit to try and explain some of these gaps than Washington Post reporter and opinion writer Greg Sargent. He has written a new book, which you guys know you can purchase back there, in which he argues that despite how fraught our political times are these days and how they seem to have gotten heightened in their fraughtness since uh, President Trump, President Trump is not the problem. Rather, he is a symptom of a larger democratic crisis at hand. And Greg's reporting documents how hyperpartisanship, dismal civic engagement, and foreign interference in our elections, among other things that he'll get into, have caused a democratic backslide. He is here to answer the question, how do we get here? What do we do? How can we strengthen democratic institutions and restore public civility to our public discourse? We are grateful to have, joining him in this conversation, playwright Robert Schenken, who wrote a Pulitzer Prize for his play, The Kentucky Cycle, and the Tony Award for Best Play in 2014 for his play, All the Way, who will be moderating the discussion. Please welcome Greg Sargent and Robert Schenken to this Brennan Center for Justice Play. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today in uh, this post-racial time. We um, have an extraordinary book here, An Uncivil War, Taking Back Our Democracy in an Age of Trumpian Disinformation and Thunderdome Politics. I particularly like the Thunderdome Politics, Thank you. written by Greg Sargent. Such a good book and so little time. Um, I came of age in the 60s, uh, Vietnam, riots, Watergate, Nixon, et cetera, messy, painful stuff. This feels different today, dangerous in its own way. But I think about the past of the republic, hyperpartisanship, uh, Preston Brooks, Kane Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate, there was that Civil War thing. Are we experiencing just a bump in the natural life cycle of democracy, or is there something different going on today? Let me just see if this is, does that work? Okay. So I, I think it's a little early to tell. Just to go to your Watergate comparison, I was uh, pretty young in those days. But, um, you know, it seemed to me that at the time, things probably looked even darker in some ways than they do now for a whole variety of reasons. And then the system actually ended up working. I, I think it's hard for people to imagine today what happened during Watergate because we're in the middle of it, meaning it's hard to picture Republicans st 
stepping forth and doing the right thing and holding this president accountable the way Republicans kind of belatedly came forward when it was no longer tenable. I, you know, there are some famous scenes, and we've all seen these uh, in, in, the, in the various accounts, but um, I think you could see us get through this almost in a way that leads us to look back on it the way we now look back on Watergate. Uh, we, we, that accountability happens in one form or other. I'm not, I don't think Trump will be um, bound to have committed criminal acts. I doubt that. But you could, I think, see a real report from Mueller come out documenting serious misconduct, obstruction of justice, and depending on how bad it is, you could conceivably see a Democratic House, if, if they win, um, take action. I don't know if he'd end up being removed, but I think we could sort of see him being severely constrained from that point on. It's just a possibility. I, well, what I you, it's what you to say. touch on there, what, the, the main difference between uh, Watergate and today, um, this sense of hyperpartisanship, as you alluded to in Watergate, there were people on the president's party who stood up and said, no, actually, this is wrong. And, and as you say, did the right thing, and, and that what is what doesn't seem to be happening today in some alarming ways, this uh, what you call hyperpartisanship, And it, it gets expressed in a number of ways, and I'd, I'd like to touch on some of the major themes that you allude to in your book. Um, uh, I think of these as battlefield issues. So voter suppression versus voter fraud. First, can we just uh, right off the bat um, distinguish whether there is such a thing as voter fraud? Is there such a thing as voter suppression? Well, by voter fraud, we mean voter impersonation fraud, which, which uh, entails uh, impersonating someone else at the polls, more or less. And that has been found to be virtually non-existent in study after study after study, whereas voter suppression is obviously a, it is an absolutely real thing. The academic literature is quite divided, though, on how effective it is in terms of disenfranchisement. The case I make in the book is that even if it is, even if the literature is inconclusive on that point, we can begin by saying that trying to make it harder for people to vote is bad, and bad for democracy, and that we shouldn't do it whether or not it has a wide disenfranchising impact. And by the way, it, the defenders of those types of tactics will say, oh, you never can prove that it's ever had an impact. But it's early, right? I mean, we don't know what's going to happen over time. Look at Georgia or North Dakota. Georgia could, the Georgia governor's race could, could hinge on, on what's happening there. And um, I think we can normatively say voter suppression is bad and wrong. And, and I, what I was interested in is that you point out in the book that this, the resurgence of this is tied to two events. One is the recount, the Florida recount which, uh, as you point out, really got both parties thinking about the importance of, <laughs> of the votes around the margins and how what a small amount of votes it could take to actually tip a statewide race, and not just a statewide, but a national race. And, and the second course of was the lamentable Supreme Court decision to remove the voting right restrictions um, previously established by President Johnson. I wonder if you just touch on those two events and how they have accelerated this uh, resurgence of voter suppression across the country. Well, I think maybe even more important than that was the election of Obama. One of the things I, I try to document in here um, um, is the concrete examples of Republican legislators passing these efforts in the ex with the explicit goal of preventing Democratic constituencies from voting. And there have been instances where some of these legislators actually blow the whistle and say, you know, this, this is what we're doing. Well, and, and they, but they, they actually cite the demographics, which I think is really quite interesting. Now, I should be clear that it's sort of hard to prove one way or the other whether it's systematic, whether it's systematically about um, fighting this kind of rear guard action against changing demographics. But you do have clear examples of Republicans passing these, these types of uh, measures while acknowledging that they are doing it because they recognize that Obama's election, which was fueled by an unprecedentedly diverse electorate, posed a long-term threat to the party. 
So to me, it, it's a lot of different things that sort of layer in one after another. The, you know, the, the Florida recount focuses everyone on the importance of voting rules and these incremental shifts that they can produce. Rising polarization gets, gets the parties looking more at turning out their partisans rather than persuading swing voters. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, sure, of course. right? Um, and then the demographic threat that Obama's election represents kicks in and then all of a sudden a lot of this stuff is happening and, and worse, um, the justification for it, voter fraud, ends up essentially persuading large chunks of the American people that that's an actual threat to them. And so they're inclined to support these types of tactics. And as you know, I had a Republican operative discussing this in a pretty interesting way. Yes, I, I, I think that's, um, that's actually something that we should touch on here. Because one of the things I found most interesting in, in Greg's book was his uh, interview with the, the Republican voter operative who was actually behind um, this effort to turn states red with the intention, well, I'll let you explain exactly what he was doing, how he did it, and how he feels about it today. Well, this is on the gerrymandering front, and there's also another one on, on the voter suppression one. Maybe I'll take it in the voter suppression one first, because, because we were on that. So one Republican who has uh, spent basically decades analyzing the opinions of Republican voters for his clients, he's a pollster, a very prominent pollster in the party, he's named in the book, um, was really candid with me in an interview. He essentially said that a lot of Republican voters have come to believe, because they've been told this for so long by their leaders and by conservative opinion makers, a lot of Republican voters, this is again a Republican talking, uh, have come to believe that there's essentially a kind of shady alliance between minority voters and the Democratic Party, and, and sometimes the minority voters include illegal ones in this narrative, and they're bought off with social service spending, and so, as he put it, these, the, the, the mindset is these minorities are on the take, and so, you know, you're damn right we're going to do whatever it takes to beat these people because they've, they're, they're rigging the system against us, and so that, that's one of, I think, the, the better interviews that I was able to get, you know, because that's really quite candid and really sort of sheds, and this is, by the way, this guy is someone who wants the party to uh, kind of, um, I guess, accept evolving demographics and tailor the party accordingly, rather than fighting this endless rear guard action against it. It's a, it's a pretty uh, comprehensive and vicious if simple uh, narrative that they're selling, if you think about it. It ties together very neatly illegal immigration, um, social services, uh, and then a, uh, a democratic conspiracy to uh, thwart the republic. It's, it's kind of yeah. the, the sweet spot of, of Fox News uh, agitation. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out how much worse and how many more sort of sinister layers have been added by Trump. I mean, right now, he, just the other day, I think he tweeted that, you know, that we're going to, we're, you know, Republic people across the country are on the lookout for voter fraud. So he's essentially endorsing the president of the United States is endorsing the um, the ongoing voter suppression that's happening right now. And then, of course, he's bringing in the caravan right, of migrants who are hundreds of miles away, and they're being manipulated by globalists. And so the sweet spot is getting a lot sweeter, <laughs> but maybe like dangerously sweet. Yes. No, I mean, I, um, I, I agree with you. I think Trump is uh, merely the tip of the spear in a lot of ways, but in some very specific ways, as you just alluded to, really uh, enhancing the, some of these issues dramatically. When the President of the United States essentially okays vigilantism at the polls, uh, you know, that's pretty serious. That's also a form of, arguably, a form of voter suppression, too, because it frightens people. I mean, it's clearly designed to do that. And, and during the campaign, by the way, I mean, this is, as you say, it's another example of him taking these pre-running pre trends and pathologies and just taking them to this other level that's just so, you know, that's just so, um, almost impossible to really wrap your head around. He, he explicitly racialized the voter fraud 
charge in a way that I hadn't really seen done this concertedly. He, he both said things like, um, he said, said that election officials were, or border officials were letting in illegal immigrants to vote, his words, illegal. Um, and uh, he also said that people from places like Philadelphia are where that are, you got to watch the polls in places like Philadelphia. That just double whammies the, the racial component to it, right? And and then the you know I, I remember distinctly being sort of threatened on Twitter by people who were Trumpists who were saying that they were going to be at their polling place with with guns and you right. know, you'd better not try to steal the election from us. And, so if voter suppression is the, is the uh, left jab, the right hook uh, possibly is gerrymandering. Right. Um, I mean, now, gerrymandering, in fairness, has been, been around the republic for a long, long time. It's actually named for a Democratic governor of Massachusetts, uh, Governor Jerry. So what's new with gerrymandering today? Why does this feel so starkly and dramatically more important and more significant uh, in the national election? It's true that it is important to say that Democrats have done a lot of that over the years, and they have a bad history of it, and including recently in, in a couple states. And, yeah. And, and, and I think it's also important to say that after, if they do take background on the state level, yeah, I think probably in early in the next, they may be in a position to influence some maps in the next decade. We really have to hold them to these standards of fairness that we're asking of Republicans, like that is crucial. We, and there will be a temptation for them to play these games. But, um, but so anyway, what, one thing that kind of makes the current situation different is, again, another kind of confluence of things that kicked in, in, in to create a, almost a perfect storm. Obama won election, again, at a time of rising anxiety about demograph demographics among Republicans. He also won when, uh, with the uh, aftermath of the financial crash, still really, really murdering people. Um, and so one could expect that the first midterm under Obama would, could conceivably feature an even bigger backlash than usual, right? That and at the same time, the first midterm of the Obama presidency coincided with the, the census so that whoever was elected in that election would draw maps for the next decade. And on top of that, the uh, technology of map drawing had been really increasing. And so Repub there were a few Republican operatives who figured out that there was a major opening here to really put the brakes on what they saw as this kind of rising demographic and progressive threat. And I, I try to tell that story in the book. And so what they did was they, they raised tens of millions of dollars and really very strategically um, invested it in state legislative races across the country mm -hmm. with an eye towards really putting the money where you, you could conceivably flip a state legislature and put it in Republican hands, right? And it, it worked. And so not only did Republicans win uh, 63, I think 63 seats in the, in the 2010 elections, but they took over a whole bunch of state legislatures. And then they were able to sort of doubly entrench their power because when they drew, all these Republican state legislatures drew the maps both for the Congress and for state legislatures, which is a, not a commonly told part of the story. Mm -hmm. So by entrenching the power of state legislatures with these maps, that guaranteed their hold on the process over time. And, and it, it's, been, it's been spectacularly successful. I, I don't. I don't have the exact numbers in my head, but I think in 2012 that was basically one of the first times, um, uh, the, the first time in many decades that Republicans lost the popular vote, but but still kind of did well in the House and held held on to the majority. I, I could be wrong on that, and, but and that was because of gerrymandering. Well, partly. I mean, the, the other thing that needs to be said, and, and I try to get into this in the book, is that population distribution really does work against Democrats. That's a real thing. It's not, it's, it's a real problem. Maybe you could just give us a sentence or two about that. Well, so um, Democratic voters are heavily distributed in cities and Republican voters are spread out across exurban and rural areas. And I think Dave Wasserman of the Cook Political Report, who's really one of the best analysts on, on, on this topic of anybody, put it really well when he said, 
what Democrats really need is a mass resettlement program. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a real problem, but it can be breached, right? But see, the thing is gerrymandering can exploit that and exacerbate it. But the population distribution is a real thing. Yeah. Well, you, you, to get back to the interview you did with the Republican operative who was one of the leading figures behind this very clearly well thought out, well financed, and well run campaign, um, I'd love to hear you share his thoughts subsequently about his yeah. success, because I, I found that really fast. So the, one of the guys who was the mastermind of that whole strategy that I just talked about, which recognized this moment as a chance to put the brakes on, on the Obama presidency by holding gerrymandering the House, um, sort of, he spent a fair, he, this guy spent a lot of time in the back rooms and spent a lot of time with map drawers, and he really knows the game from the inside. And what he told me was that he, he had come to realize that it really was absurd, that, that this type of the extreme gerry partisan gerrymanders really are just fundamentally undemocratic. And he essentially said we need guardrails now. And what he favors is probably not what a lot of people in this room would favor. He's probably less inclined towards things like nonpartisan commissions and would like to see states pass laws or I guess amend their constitutions to create some sort of limits on this type of gerrymandering. And also, I should say that, you know, he, 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 this guy's a pretty, he's a savvy operator, so when he says our Republicans really are abusing the process, what he also really means is, you know, he's talking about some of the kind of boneheaded state... state, he state means you're state. spilling the beans, guys. Exactly. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, exactly. Right. So he, he's talking about these kind of boneheads who just, like, ridiculously gerrymandered the map in, in their own favor, and he just, he's, he, he's basically saying, be a little more subtle about it. But we, we, um, we have a problem, you know, even when we try to take this to the courts, uh, where there have been several attempts to get the courts to, and specifically the Supreme Court, to, to rule on this, always without success, even though, uh, particularly this last case that was presented seemed, seemed pretty impressive. Uh, to many of us. So you, you want to comment yeah. on, on yeah, yeah, this, sure. this mean, situation? I, I mean, unfortunately, without Kennedy, it looks even less likely um, now. That, so at least Kennedy had, Kennedy had said over the years, and I think everyone here probably knows this story, but I'll, I'll go through it. Anyway. But Kennedy had said that he was open to a workable standard by which you could say th this level of partisan gerrymandering crosses over into something unconstitutional. But again, he, he keeps not being satisfied by what, you know, what, by what get, gets put forth, and again, he, he, he punted again. But now he's gone, and so the, the, the new conservative majority, according to the experts I spoke to on this, uh, really think it's even less likely that this conservative majority would ever, ever step into police um, partisan gerrymandering, no matter how bad it gets. And by the way, also, they're also even less likely to strike down uh, future voter suppression um, uh, tactics that, that I think we don't know how bad they're going to get. And even at the federal level, even if, it, if this was a, not, yeah, just, I think not they an would, individual state, but a yeah, federal I think they would, bill. It's hard to imagine them striking down anything. And that, that's bad because, I mean, we, we need to sort of accept how bad that is because, for, first of all, you've got maybe, what, four of them appointed now by presidents who didn't win the popular vote, or at least, mm -hmm. so at least four, and, and potentially soon if, if there's another opening, you could have five. You could have a whole major, a majority on the court appointed by presidents who, who ascended Bush, in fairness, won re-election, mm -hmm. won the popular vote when he was re-elected, but didn't when he was. And so that plus the fact that um, the senators who confirm those Republican justices, Republican-picked justices, tend to represent a minority of the population nationally because of the, uh, because of the Senate imbalance, that creates a situation in which uh, a, a minority Supreme Court essentially will allow Republicans to continue using these types of tactics to entrench, to, to entrench counter-majoritarian rule. So that, that's not a, I think we have to accept that that's not good. Yeah. Um, the third thing I, uh, that you touch on in the book that I, that I really want to get to, uh, what you call disinformation nation, um, 
there, there are two quotes I, I want to share with the room. This is Hannah Arendt in 1974 in the New Yorker magazine. If everybody lies to you, the consequence is not that you believe the lies, but that rather nobody believes anything any longer. A people that no longer believe anything cannot make up its mind. It is deprived not only of the capacity to act, but also its capacity to think and to judge. And with such a people, you can do then as you please. That's Hannah Arendt in 1974. And Donald Trump, a, two years ago, I will suck all the air out of the room. Um, let's talk about disinformation, false equivalency, enemy construction, this, the, the competing narratives that break down of major sources of media. Who do we believe? Who should we believe? How do we get our information? And how is this, all of this being exploited in this moment? Well, I think one really terrible development that I write about in here has been that Republican voters are very captive to Trump's attacks on the press. Um, some of the polling is quite worrisome. It shows that the good part is that majorities, so Trump, Trump has probably attacked the press in, an, in a way that's absolutely unprecedented. Former presidents have tangled with the press. Nixon mm -hmm. did, he even called them the enemy in, in private. He put forth um, his vice president to attack the networks and so forth. But there's something different going on now, it seems to me, in, in the sense that Trump is really trying to destroy the institutional role of the press in, in, in our democracy. It's a, it's a, it's, he doesn't accept it, it, that it plays a legitimate, he doesn't have a grudging acceptance of it as something that he is supposed to be tangling with, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the constant attacks on, on, on the press is fake, even after um, deranged people threaten to murder reporters using his language, the attacks continue even though you know, that, that happens. Um, those types of constant attacks have, have really hastened the process by which Republican voters have been told to stop believing anything they hear from the media. And so Quinnipiac's polling is very worrisome. It does show that majorities of Americans overall trust the press over Trump to tell them the truth, but very large majorities of Republican voters trust Trump and not over the press to tell them the truth. And it's hard to know what to make of that because a lot of the time when people answer pollsters, they're just registering hostility. So a lot of the people could be saying that because they're just angry at the press for doing what Trump claims that they do, which they don't actually do, but never mind that. Um, but I think it's still worrisome. It, it, it points to what I think could get War, it's something that could get a lot worse if, if the Mueller probe starts to yield real results. We could see really a full-scale effort by Trump and, and the sort of propaganda network that's behind him to absolutely melt down in the minds of Republican voters these institutions, law enforcement and the media. And I, I don't know where that ends up, really. I mean, it's a concerted campaign to delegitimize major U.S. institutions in the minds of millions. And you, you see this, again, not just as Trump, but as uh, uh, the Republican Party uh, as a whole, certainly lined up uh, in support of this. I mean, when, when um, that reporter was uh, uh, knocked, knocked down by the uh, representative, and it was in the... Uh, GM, GM. Right, yeah. yes, right. So people said, oh, no, that's bad. Um, and then just two weeks ago, I think Trump was calling that representative my kind of guy and, and, and mocking this. And there was no Republican outcry there. I mean, they seem, if, if not complicit, uh, if, if not actually uh, part of this, certainly complicit by their silence, by their failure to stand up here. Yeah, and it sort of seems like these um, Republican elected officials actually fear backlash. They can't, I mean, look what happened to Flake, right? A lot of people criticize Flake. He, he, they say, oh, well, you know, he votes with Trump 90% of the time, blah, blah, blah. So whatever he says on the Senate floor doesn't matter. I, I don't really agree with that. I think those things do matter. 
when Republicans stand up and say that the president is fundamentally a non undemocratic actor, I think that's important. Of course, they could always do more. But even so, there's been a huge shortage of that, mm -hmm. right? So there's like a, a, a really massive price to pay with Republican voters for simply telling the truth about Trump's anti-democratic conduct. So what makes it then advantageous or uh, possible for Republican, uh, will, what will make that advantageous or possible uh, in the future for them to, to actually stand up f among senators who are not retiring? I, I don't know, that's, that's the problem. I don't think any of us knows how, how to turn that around, really. I, I, there's been some interesting writing out there which essentially says that the way forward is for for the press to reassert its commitment to its core liberal democratic values and to really recognize that it's essentially in a public fight with um, the, uh, for Jay Rosen, who's here, not here in this room, but at this university, yeah. has done a lot of work on this, which I strongly recommend you check out. It's really good stuff. Um, he argues that, um, that the press has to reassert itself in, 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 with the understanding that it's in a public fight for, for survival, in a sense. What does that mean, reassert itself? So, what, what would be different than what they're doing now, for example? Well, so you've probably seen these kind of tortured debates over whether to call Trump out for lying. A lie is a lie, or, or a lie is he just misspoke, or he... Right, and, and, and so there's often an argument you hear, which is that it's actually factual to say that he's wrong, or, or and it's not, it's not, it's, it's anti-factual to say that he's lying because you don't know what his motive is. You don't know that he intends to deceive and so forth. And, and what, I write, what I argue in the book is that it's actually anti-factual and misleading to not call what he's doing lying because not, not, not in, in, in the sense of any particular one claim, but more in a broader sense. Mm -hmm. what, what has to be conveyed and isn't, I don't think, adequately being conveyed to people by the coverage is this kind of concerted, deliberate campaign to obliterate the possibility of shared facts and to really essentially destroy the institutional role of the press in, in mediating. And, and if you don't call out the lying systematically and regularly and, and relentlessly, what gets lost is that larger impression it creates the impression that, oh, Trump is maybe delusional today, this other day he's misinformed, this, yet this other time he's, you know, he's, he's kind of bluffing, he's blustering, and, and mm -hmm. that all that stuff just soft pedals what's actually happening and right. actually ends up misleading people. I've also uh, uh, read and, and, uh, and feel myself that, that in the press response, too often the, um, the exact... Uh, uh, examination of what he said and the calling out of it is buried so far down in the in the article that you, you don't ever get there as a reader as opposed to putting it in the headline. The headline doesn't say Trump lies about immigrant, you know, Trump Trump's lie about immigrant camera, uh, caravan full of criminals coming to sell drugs. You know, it just says Trump speaks strongly about caravan and then three paragraphs down it says Trump claims that there are they're coming here, and they're criminals, and they're going to sell drugs, and that's what this, and they're being paid by George Soros, and you right. know, but that's that's all get buried. It'll be like uh, you, know, you get headlines like Trump's Trump charges Democrats with orchestrating caravan. That's, that's like, the headline, right? Right, and so, well, <laughs> but it's not it's not informative, right? Because he's it's utterly baseless and false charge, and and w one thing that that I get into in here is the fact that some of, the, um, some of the news organizations which came of age in the internet era understand this problem better than the traditional ones do. So, hmm. like BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. um, so they, uh, they, they really, I have an interview with a BuzzFeed editor about this topic, which, which uh, he, he really did, came through with some good quotes on this. He essentially said that in, in, in the social media era, because headlines take on a life of their own, independent of articles, thanks to social media and news feeds, it's even more crucial to, to label in those headlines 
when a claim is baseless or false. And, and it's, it's, I think there's no doubt that Trump, on some instinctual level, understands the new environment and gets that if he injects charges relentlessly into the bloodstream and they're not corrected, and even if they are corrected, I mean, probably, he probably still gets, he, he gets what he wants out of it to some degree, but we're, we're all sort of fighting this action against. It's a, it's a, it's a one-two punch. It not only uh, degrades the whole notion of facts and truth and, and the media, but it, it also simultaneously gets him airtime. It, his, his face is there. His voice is there, relentlessly. That's what he meant by, I will suck all the air out of the room. And, yeah. and, and in the, the narrowness of attention span today as we consume media or consume any kind of entertainment, um, you know, that, all that matters is that, is that image, is that voice, because we're only going to look at it for 30 seconds or 60 seconds or, God forbid, maybe two minutes. I'd actually like to link this back to what you started with, the Watergate stuff, because there's another aspect to this that I don't think is sufficiently appreciated, which is that Nixon didn't, when, so when Nixon went into battle to save his presidency, he didn't have the kind of apparatus, this kind of propaganda apparatus behind him that Trump does. And by the way, it's, it's worth noting that, and I, I talk about this in here too, that a lot of the pro-Trump media not only attacks his enemies and says that anything that Mueller is looking into is fake and, and says that whatever Trump says is true, whether it's he's getting the wall today and he's not getting the wall, that it's always true no matter what, even, right? But those, those propaganda outlets also attack the press. So they're not just pushing Trump's disinformation, they're also pushing his messaging designed to delegitimize the mainstream press. And so I, to go back to what you asked about where this all ends up, it seems to me that if there's a sustained confrontation with Mueller that's even worse than the one we've seen, right, we don't know how, um, what the impact will be of this added kind of apparatus that he's got that Nixon didn't have. So I think in a lot of ways that could end up making it harder for Republicans to turn on him because they'll be just getting pulverized endlessly by this messaging that, that really, and by the way, another thing that I talk about in here is that Republican officials tend to really only care about conservative media in a way that Democrats, right, Democrat, there's, an imbal there's a fundamental imbalance between the parties, which is that Republicans really uh, don't care as much what the mainstream news organizations say and do care what their, their partisan media says whereas Democrats are much more enthralled to being criticized by the, the, the mainstream press and, and less and less worried about what the, the, the liberal media says. And so this imbalance is, I, I, I really, what worries me a lot is what happens if there's this sustained confrontation with Mueller and, and this enormous information apparatus is just on his side during it. I don't know what happens then. It's, it's interesting. What, what you're describing, if I can just step back for a second, it, this, um, what you talk about in the book, how parties have now sorted themselves along racial, geographic, and social lines, and in the consequence, there's been a sea change in how, in how the two parties once looked um, at the time of Watergate, where, you, where the parties were, had, had three, each party had three parts. They had, a, they had a, a liberal wing. The Republicans had a liberal wing. It was a very healthy group. Um, a conservative wing and a solid middle. And same thing for the Democrats. There are very conservative Democrats, a liberal wing, obviously. And middle. Well, the wings have disappeared from both parties, essentially. It, it's, all, it's all this, this center, or actually more towards the conservative. Um, and, and as a consequence, um, and part of this is driven, I think, by gerrymandering, which uh, you're, you're baking uh, uh, increasingly um, larger numbers of single issue voters in a district and all you have to do is please those voters. You don't have to please the re anybody else in there. You're, you're not worried about compromise. In fact, compromise is a dirty word. Compromise gets you killed politically if you're accused of compromising. It's interesting because that actually ends up frustrating Republican leaders at certain times. There's a, there's a video that 
went viral at one point. Remember Speaker John Boehner? I don't know if anybody remembers him. Yes. <laughs> we yearn for the days of John Boehner. <laughs> he, he was, I, I think, from what I could tell, he, he really wanted to get his party to a point where they could make a deal with Obama on immigration. I think Paul Ryan did as well. You, you could tell by their media appearances that they were just trying to push as far as they could towards a deal without getting absolutely murdered by their partisan media for mm -hmm. it, right? But then one day Boehner, you know, he, he might have been um, chemically enhanced or something, <laughs> but he, uh, but he, um, he, he made, started to mock, it's, it's on video, he started to mock Republicans and, and he essentially did so by saying, oh, I can't do immigration reform, it's too hard, it's too hard, it's too hard. And of course, he's the speaker, he could just put it on the floor, right? right, right? right. So take that with a grain of salt, but he was actually getting at a, a truth, which is that their own vote, all these rank and file Republicans, some of whom might have recognized that legalizing the undocumented really is the solution, yeah. just couldn't do it. Um, right. I, I really want to uh, turn the conversation for a moment to um, w where we go in the future. Um, this, this whole question, given this hyper-partisanship, is the notion of fair play politically even possible, or, or is the game now uh, a zero-sum game for dominance? Where does that leave Democrats? You know, Democrats were famously they go low, we go high. And, um, um, you know, the, the, the quote that, uh, uh, that I, comes to mind from uh, uh, Bannon, not someone I normally quote in public, is that, uh, you know, we come prepared for, we, we, we give a, a shot to the head and Democrats come with a pillow fight. And the shot to the head always beats the pillow fight. So when Democrats, God willing, take some of these legislators back, legislatures back, uh, and possibly the House, um, which, which road should they take? How, how should they respond to this? Is there a way to respond when you feel the other side is, uh, has clearly decided the rules just don't apply anymore? What, what's your responsibility? So there's gonna be a tremendous amount of pressure, if that ever happens, there's gonna be a lot of pressure from the left right, and not all of it, but parts of it, to really go for full-blown procedural hardball. And, and the, the problem is that they actually have a decent case to make because of how Republicans have conducted themselves. What does that mean, full procedural so hardball? That what might that look like? like being prepared to pack the courts if, um, if, if the conservative majority invalidates progressive legislation based on invented legal theories or um, immediately doing away with the filibuster on legislation so that they can pass things with a simple majority. I think the way to understand the question is, is there any point to, a, to, to asymmetrically pursuing fair procedural fairness in politics, right? Yes. And I argue in here that there is a point to it that, that, that you have to, that what Democrats should do if this ever, if, if they ever take things back, mm -hmm. is to try for a balance between escalating in a selected way where appropriate, right? But also really trying to move towards procedural fairness kind of in an opportunistic way, picking your places where you can do that. And, and I think one, one area is, for instance, on the gerrymandering front, I don't think anyone wants Democrats to, to go back to their old tradition of partisan rigging, mm -hmm. right? I don't think anyone wants them to do what um, Republicans have done in the last decade on that. And so I, I argue for trying to move towards nonpartisan redistricting commissions or solutions like that that essentially take the procedural weaponry off the table. But don't you have, to, don't you have to have the power first? And, well, yeah, and, but so that's and, what, right. And to, so it, and to acquire that power, don't you have to play hardball? I mean, is, is there, well, yes. just to, 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 you know, be devil's advocate here, sometimes, you know, you can't get somebody's attention without a two by four to the head. And then once you've got their attention, then you can talk sensibly and rationally about how normal people function in a healthy relationship. Right. Is, there a point to, is there a point to that? I, mean, I think I, that it's worth distinguishing between playing hardball in, in, the, in, in the campaign context and then mm -hmm. 
applying it once you have power, right? I think you're mm -hmm. talking about. Okay. So I, I, you know, if you look at how Obama ran his campaigns, he he he, he was, he used the two by four, mm -hmm. and he won majorities twice. Mm -hmm. And I think the way Democrats are campaigning this time, they're they're being pretty aggressive. At that. They're, they're, they're deliberately opting for kind of a high-toned approach, which I think they think contrasts with Trump. They also think voters really just only care about health care. And I, I hope they're right, right? But, I, you know, they could get back into power before you know it, and that's when the question kicks in of, of whether you play hardball. Well, it's this, it's this terrible balance, isn't it? I mean, you, you're, the, the whole field has been tilted. There's no question about that. It's not op the, the, the the mechanisms, as you say, are under considerable stress and an actual attack. And um, in order to make everybody uh, play by the same rule, it, it feels like, well, normally there are penalties when you break the rules. So, so what, what is, what actually require, what will provide restoration is some punitive action so that you, f you feel our pain and then we can both agree that pain like this is not helpful. Let's find a different way to do this. But you've got to get in power first, right? You and do have to get in power first. And, and, uh, but again, campaign hardball is sort of a mm -hmm. different animal from the type of procedural hardball you exercise once you have the power, right? It's, it's one thing to really just push the envelope with attack ads, and it's another mm -hmm. to actually use the power you've got to rig maps and suppress votes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to say that Democrats, a Democratic state legislature in the future should pass a law that makes it harder for, that's deliberately targeted to making it harder for working class whites to vote, for instance. I, you know, I don't think that seems pretty that. unlikely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, the point is that, so these types of areas are, I think, places, by the way, I should say that a lot of conservatives can actually be brought into this stuff. I did a podcast with a guy named Matt Lewis, who's a prominent conservative. Um, writer, and, and he actually, he and I were able to agree on a lot of these things. On, on What did you agree on? Well, like, on some form of, of nonpartisan redistricting commission apparatus that we'd agree. Mm -hmm. um, things like structuring voting rules in a way that you can, I mean, Rick Hassan from Irvine, who's a really, really good scholar on this stuff, has suggested that Democrats offer a kind of deal in which Mm. in which uh, they're willing to accept a form of voter ID that is absolutely not disenfranchising and is structured that way in exchange for an agreement on Republicans' part to make it as easy to vote as possible. Mm. And so these things are, and, and this guy, you know, I was encouraged by his... Well, that is encouraging, and, I, and I, I want us to come back around to that at the end, but I think um, we should take a moment and open it up um, to the audience. Um, uh, for those of you who may have questions, we have mics, standing mics on either side of the room if you'll, you'll line up. And what we'll ask you uh, to do is to ask a single question, not a statement, a, a single, not bi bifurcated question, uh, which Greg will uh, happily answer for you. So why don't we, we start here? Okay. With that precursor, you really cut me off, but that's okay. Um, I have a great idea for the Washington Post later, but I'll find you. Uh, the question is around polling. I don't know that I believe in polls after 2016, and maybe my knowledge about polling is too dated, like people only poll to people with home phone numbers, which a lot of people don't have home phone numbers anymore. I mean, after what we saw with the polls saying it was definitely going one way and it went the other way, do you really believe in polls anymore? Yeah, I do. I, th I think you can, if you just dig around on, on, on the internet, you'll find good articles on this, but the polling actually wasn't that far off in 2016. She won the popular vote by, Clinton won the popular vote by, um, what, uh, three million. nearly three million and about two to three points. A lot of the polling, when averaged together, actually did find that. It's true that some of the state polls were a little off. I think one of the things that created the problem was that, that the, the, the letter from James Comey at the very end kind of hit before the polling could catch up to it. And so there was a lot of slippage going on right after that letter. And you could see the polling change, but it didn't change fast enough. Because sometimes it takes a while for polling to catch up with what's happening with people. And so polling is not perfect. It's going to be wrong. So in this election, if it's off a couple points in one way or another, you know, if the polling is off 
right now in a way that's just two points short of what Republicans actually command. Democrats could be in, in not get the House. But conversely, if the polling's off by one or two points in a direction that favors Dem Democrats, right, then they could have an even bigger victory than we think. I don't think we should give up on polling. They're constantly updating it. The, the, what I would strongly encourage is to focus on polling averages more than anything else. At places like 538 or... Yeah, or, night's um, over. Yeah. Um, this gentleman here. Uh, hi, thank you so much for, um, for coming. Um, I'm wondering about like, the extent to which there can be this, this sort of like, common sense barrier to the kind of changes we need. So, for example, in my home state of North Carolina, there's a, a ballot measure, for a voter ID ballot measure that looks overwhelmingly likely to pass, uh, even in polls that show Democratic candidates doing well. And what was interesting to me was that, of course, white voters are more likely to support it than voters of color, but even a majority or plurality of voters of color support it. And I, I get the sense that there's kind of this common sense logic among voters in general that like, well, yeah, I mean, maybe the Republicans are doing it for the wrong reason, but of course you should have to show it an ID to vote. So how do you, how do you push back against that? Do we just like hammer like these are the effects or, you know, of these sorts of laws and, you know, how, how do you make the case against it? Common it's, sense. It's absolutely true that voter ID is popular. I mean, that's a real, I mean, I think the Brennan people could attest to that. Um, and so, one, th one, one thing that people don't understand is the targeted nature of some of these, right? So they hear, oh, well, people just have to show ID. What they don't, what doesn't happen is the crossover to the point of this particular voter ID was, law was structured in a way that it was designed to have deliberate disenfranchising effects by allowing some types of ID and not other ones. And, and so it's very hard to get that message across. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I do think Democrats can stand for a compromise, though, that accepts some form of it, as long as it's structured in a non-disenfranchising way and, 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 and funds the provision of ID to people and doesn't penalize them in, in a too onerous way for not having it. So I, I don't know if the argument can be won, frankly. Um, what may have to happen is Democrats have to take power and, and, and undo these laws where they're bad. And, and, and that, that kind of goes back to what you're, you're talking about, which is that in some cases you might have to play hardball to get things to a point of procedural fairness. Yes, ma'am. Quite apart from, from voting suppression measures, um, a lot of people, particularly minorities, do not vote. They don't register, and if they're registered, they don't vote. So what, how does that affect the analysis of what's wrong, and what do we do about that? Well, what I argue for in the book is automatic voter registration, which is um, a big thing for, the, for a lot of voting advocates. Some people have actually argued for mandatory voting, which I don't come out for, but is there, there are good arguments for it. One thing that's really dispiriting, and I get into this in the book, is why is, is how hard it is to get non-voters to vote. I, I actually quote, um, I did some interviews with a Democratic um, ground organizer and also a Democratic pollster who has spent many years focus grouping non-voters non to understand what makes them tick. And what they both reported back is that what they unanimously run off against is that there's, that non-voters are surrounded by other non-voters. And there's a culture of it that's very hard to press through and things like automatic voter registration make it easier because if people are, what automatic voter registration does is it registers you automatically if you come in contact with a, with a government agency giving you the option to opt out. And the reason that that works is because um, once your name is on the rolls, the campaigns can much more intensively target you. And that type of intensive targeting is what at least according to the people who I interviewed who grappled with this regularly, that kind of intensive, repeated targeting of people is how you get past the culture of non-voting. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for writing the book. It sounds like it's very important and useful. My question has to do with, uh, I'm not sure if you say this in the book, but part of the introduction to you, uh, the young lady spoke, uh, I think the phrase, 
uh, Trump is not the problem, and then you go on to make the point that the deeper issue is what I would call the collective uh, immune system of our body politic is the problem, and I think that that's, that's a valid hypothesis. However, I think to imply even, even indirectly that Donald Trump is not the problem is a mistake. When you have a pathogen, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, or a cancer that's invaded your body, Yes, if you had a great immune system, you wouldn't have got it. So it's not the problem in that overall abstract sense. But it is the problem. You have to extirpate it. You have to cure it. You have to strengthen the immune I'm, system. I'm you sorry, sir. Your, your question So my is? question is this. Will you correct the impression that you mean to say that Donald Trump is not the problem? Because I disagree with that strongly. Yeah, here's, It's more here's complicated the, than that. Yeah, the case I make in the book is not necessarily that he isn't a problem. It's more that that there's this kind of core disconnect you know, that we're dealing with, which is that it was only after someone like Trump came along who is openly and visibly and relentlessly hostile to democracy, it took that to get everybody focused on the health of our political system. And it shouldn't have taken that to, to get us focused on it. That's really the core case. I mean, he's, uh, he is clearly a, a hideously undemocratic actor, and he's dragging the Republican Party into to a much worse place than, than it was. Um, but it shouldn't, we shouldn't need him to galvanize our kind of pro-democracy energy, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think, uh, if, if I may, um, you know, one of the reasons that uh, uh, bolsters the notion that while Trump is a huge problem, there is a bigger problem and either, is if you look at Western democracies across the world right now, across the world, under assault, under assault, nationalists, very right wing, strong man, populist leaders, um, uh, winning uh, elections all across Europe and, and, and yesterday in South America. This is a, a major problem worldwide that all democracies are facing, whether it's, it's Trump and the GOP here, or Five Star in Italy, or the Liberty Party in um, Austria, or, or what have you. There are some ill winds blowing, um, and, and we need to deal with that. Sir, ma'am? Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is about the history of voting, because um, over 15 years ago, I read a couple of books about the secret societies, and they suggest the vote fixed always had been on the table. So uh, if the, those secret societies, like the Masons, for example, to mention one, uh, they decide who is going to be the next president. If people vote or not, it doesn't matter. This is going to be the president, and this is going to be the president. It doesn't matter what people say or what people vote. So also they, they are agree, and uh, it, uh, we either party has to be agree on that. So I, I am curious about the, uh, why, you know, wh what do you think about this? Well, I, I think if I understand you right, I, I think one of the things that is strong about our system is that, that I think I think, at least, uh, that our elections are essentially fundamentally not rigged in, 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 in that type of sense. It's a much more subtle kind of backsliding that we're talking about. We're not talking about, right, the democratic backsliding I write about in here is not the theft of elections or, or, uh, or that type of level of fraud. It's a much more incremental kind of erosion which occurs when the rules of political competition are captured and manipulated and perverted. And a lot of this stuff is very hard to measure and quantify, and, and because of the way our system is dispersed, it's hard to get your head around how bad it is at any given moment. But one thing I get into in the book here is that, that some political scientists have actually tried to develop ways of measuring this stuff, and I write about those. And, and they're really quite creative and mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and I, the one thing that they, rate our they tend to rate our democracy strongly on is this type of point. That doesn't appear to be a worry, although with, with the Russian um, subversion, it's sort of hard to say whether we're going into another phase of this that could be even worse. Yes, sir. Uh, great discussion, gentlemen. Um, 
It seems to me like the tone of today's discussion has centered on Republicans, conservatives, people on the right will do it. Take any measure possible to win elections, entrench themselves in power, and then Democrats, liberals, etc., come at it, you know, to quote Bannon, with a pillow. On the surface, that seems a bit naive to me, like everybody on one side is, we'll do anything, and everybody on the other side is, well, we're just gonna have to win elections and get more people to vote. And so are you really saying that there is a lot of systematic evidence that the Republicans are a better organized, better at the game? Um, in other words, what are you saying? Like, Democrats don't do this at all, or they're no, just they're not, not good at it, or they're there's such small effort that they're not successful? It sort of depends on the area. So in the area of gerrymandering, like I said, there is a long history of Democrats perverting the rules, and we absolutely should be vigilant against that in the future. It's, it's basic fairness requires it. On voter suppression, though, it really is, there really is a stark difference. And, and right. there, there really, it, it just is true that one party wants to make it harder to vote in a sort of more general sense. Now, they, they have arguments for defending that. I just don't think that they're good arguments. I think they're bad arguments. I think they, they're undemocratic arguments. And, and so, no, I wouldn't say it's a simple, I, I don't mean to convey that at all. I, um, like I write in here, Obama and the Democrats, when they were in power, also played their share of procedural hardball. Mm -hmm. It's just asymmetric. I think that's the way to understand sure. it. Okay. Really, saying something a is asymmetric is not the same as saying only one side does something. Right, right. It's, it's just trying to accurately gauge you know, what the balance is. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, good afternoon. I'm really enjoying the discussion. Uh, I'm an educator. And I want to get at the culture of the non-voter, because that's very important. I run into it all the time. And so it's a very simple question, but probably has a very complex answer. What would a comprehensive voter education, registration, and mobilization project look like? That's a really tough question. I mean, it really would depend on how far you're willing to go. Some people advocate for mandatory voting, which, um, which I don't really argue for, but I understand the case for it. I go for somewhat more incremental solutions like automatic voter registration, which I think could make a really big difference. Making it easier to vote in as many ways as possible seems to me to be a step in this direction for instance. Mm -hmm. the, the, the trouble, one of the difficult questions that there's a lot of disagreement on is whether participation actually makes you into a better democratic citizen to begin with. And you might have had personal experience with that in a way that I haven't. But I, as I write in here, the science is, the political science is divided on this question, but there's at least some evidence that participation, if you can make it easy enough and create enough incentives to do it, does actually lead voters to inform themselves more than they might and improves their democratic citizenry, as it were. But it's, there are no easy answers to this one. Yeah. Thank you. We're, we're, we're almost out of time here. I'm going to take this one last question, and then we'll, uh, okay, we'll wrap uh, things up. Uh, in trying to uh, understand uh, Republican, their, the leadership, the, the mindset of the leadership, and maybe the actions or inactions that they're taking right now, is it possible that they see the demographics continually shifting and worry that they will eventually lose elections and see their country become a different kind of country, character changing. And if they feel that, won't they do everything in their power to prevent it by all the means we've been talking about? But I see this short term and long term. It's a little hard to say. I mean, Republicans differ on this stuff. I mean, the, po the Republicans that I interview in here actually think that the appropriate response to what you're talking about is for the party to try to do better at reaching out to, to non-white voters. And you saw in the, in the 2016 election, that played out very dramatically. Because remember, after 2012, after Obama's second majority win, right? And that's a big, I mean, he won popular majorities twice. Um, after that, the Republican Party put out this big report in which they said that they were going to improve on gay rights, and, and they were going to improve on immigration. And I, I still remember a line from that report, which was, if, if, if Latinos think that, that we don't want them in our, in our party, they're not going to want to be in our party, right? And so 
there was a time when it looked like Republicans might respond to these changes by nominating Marco Rubio, right? And really trying to, to, mm -hmm. um, to, to evolve. But, but Trump and some of the people around him and some types of political thinkers on the right argued that there actually is this untapped reservoir of more white voters, right? And so Trump was able to access that pool of disaffected white voter, which enabled him to win yet another election without evolving in step with demographics. And so I don't know how much longer they keep chasing that. You would think at some point, but of course they have to lose first, right? They keep, I they mean, have they to have lose won, first. so. We're, we're, we're almost out of time. I, I would love for you to leave us, because uh, we've been talking about some very dark <laughs> profoundly frustrating issues, uh, particularly as we approach uh, the election next week. Um, is there some silver lining here, or, or is there, are there some action steps that we can concretely take or put our shoulders to, to change, uh, to, to fight back, to push back uh, against this situation um, in, the, in the near future? What should we be doing? What could we be doing? Vote and get as many people as possible to vote that you can. I mean, it seems to me that, to return to the, the point you raised at the very beginning, you can envision scenarios in which we look back at this as a bit of a hiccup. A bit of a hiccup. Hiccup. Right? So imagine if Democrats, and I, the premise of this book is that Democrats, big D Democrats, are more likely to pass pro small d democracy reforms than Republicans are. So if you're a Democratic partisan or just someone who wants to revitalize democracy, the Democratic Party is the way to go, at least for now. Um, and so if Democrats take back the House, you could see a restoration of real oversight over mm -hmm. Trump, which we just have not had, and that's mm -hmm. a crucial, I think that's crucial to restoring faith in governing. Mm -hmm. um, you, if Democrats are able to win back some ground on the level of the states, for instance, flipping a number of governorships, you could see, um, you could see, I should just say this because we didn't get into this and it, it is important. So in, in many states, Democrat uh, governors can actually veto the maps that state legislatures draw for, the, for Congress and the state, and state legislature. And so it, if Democrats can get in in some of these big states, they will have a seat at the table to be able to block these gerrymandered maps into the next decade, and that could really unwind yeah. some of the partisan rigging. And so, I, then they could, uh, Democratic governors can push for democracy reforms like automatic voter mm -hmm. registration. They can try to ease up onerous voter ID laws. So, my case in here is that incremental improvements are possible and can add up over time. And you, if 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 some if some of that starts to come to pass. It seems to me things will look a lot better than they do now. Yeah. Certainly, what we, what we can take some um, solace in is that there is considerable pushback and that there is enormous re-engagement. Uh, I, I feel it, and I, and I think statistically you can, you can prove this. You know, look at the number of women who are running for office in this election compared to two years ago. It's a staggering change uh, and, and a very positive one. So I think, I think that's something that... that uh, more diverse, too, by the way. And more diverse, and more diverse. So um, we need to bring this uh, to a close. I'm sorry to do so, but our thanks to uh, Washington Post reporter Greg Sargent, and we certainly wish him great success with his book, An Uncivil War, Taking Back Our Democracy in an Age of Trumpian Disinformation and Thunderdome Politics. I'm Robert Schenken. You can uh, please keep up with the work of the Brennan Center for Justice. Online, they're at brennancenter.org. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, watch our videos on YouTube, and listen to our podcasts on iTunes. Um, thank you to the audience here at the NY Law School and to all of those listening online. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question.